Hello and welcome everyone um, to How I Built This Online. I hope you are safe and well. I'm Guy Raz and I'm speaking to you from my home, from my studio in my home uh, in the Bay Area and I hope, um, hope you're doing okay. These are obviously really challenging times for everybody, for people struggling to, to stay healthy, um, for people who are sick, for people who have lost loved ones, um, and for m millions of you who are out there watching um, who are out of work or losing revenue. Um, so really, we're here to, to, to kind of talk with some of the founders who've been on How I Built This to find out how they're managing, how they're navigating this crisis and how they're coping and, and really how they're trying to figure out how to build resiliency during this really difficult time. Um, we're taking your questions, so please don't forget to submit your questions on, on, on the Facebook uh, comments section. Um, we would love to have them, so please keep them coming. I'm super excited to have with me today, David Nieleman, uh, founder of JetBlue. David, as you know, of course, founded JetBlue, uh, WestJet in Canada. He co-owns TAP Airlines in Brazil. He's the founder of Azul Airways in, uh, TAP Airways in Portugal, but Azul Airways in Brazil, which is one of the biggest air carriers in South America. Um, in February of this year, he launched his newest airline, Breeze, uh, which is designed to connect smaller cities in the United States with direct flights. Um, if you listen to How I Built This, you will remember David's episode where he started in the travel industry as a college student um, selling timeshares in Hawaii. Um, it's so great to have you, David. Welcome to the show. Um, first of all, uh, where, where are you right now? Where am I, where am I seeing you? Um, I'm in my home in, in Connecticut. So I'm just in the tri-state area, kind of at the epicenter of what's going on here. You know, just about a less than an hour's drive from New York City. And how are you? How are you and your family holding up? I, from what I understand, like you've got grandkids at the house too. Like you've got a whole, a whole city, a whole little village in there, right? We do. Uh, my oldest daughter, Ashley, and her husband Matt, and five kids. Uh, Ashley's pregnant with her sixth. So, um, you know, we decided to kind of hunker down together here, and uh, so they're here, and it's great because you know I can I can see my grandkids every day, and and. Uh, Obviously, we're we're following the rules and we're we're staying safe. Um, the rest of the family is is kind of scattered around, but centralized in, in Utah and, and uh, another family unit in Texas. So everyone's safe, everybody's yeah. good, and we're just uh, looking forward to getting through this. We we last saw each other in October at the How I Built the Summit in San Francisco in a, in a very different world. It was so great to see you there, and you talked about you know resiliency and because you've had a lot of ups and downs in your career and a lot of um success and failure which is what makes you so interesting um you created JetBlue and then you were ousted from JetBlue and then you started Azul and Breeze and all these incredible companies you're a serial entrepreneur and um and as I say you've had your fair share of of failure and success um certainly we're now um I think all of us agree this is probably the most challenging time, certainly for business, um, that anyone can remember. First of all, um, give, give us a sense of, of how Azul is doing right now in Brazil. What's going on? Well, Brazil's, you know, very similar to the United States. Um, you know, the, the, there's a little bit of a divergence between the president of Brazil and, you know, and the governors. Um, the governors have decided to, you know, kind of go shelter in place or, you know, close down businesses similar to the United States. You know, the president's more kind of in a vertical, you know, trying to protect those that are most at risk. But, yeah. you know, our, our business is off 95%. Um, wow. Obviously, we had, we had 900 flights a day before, before the crisis. We're down to under 50, 50 flights a day. Wow. Um, our revenue, um, we were doing uh, something close to 10 million a day. Now we're doing, um, you know, 5% of that. So, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a big challenge. And, but, you know, one of the great things, you know, when you build great companies, you have great people. And, um, you know, we have about uh, 13,000 people that work for, for Azul. And so we went out to the, to the group and said, hey, you know, everybody, um, we're going to need your help here. Who would, who would like to uh, take a few months off without pay? Um, and remarkably enough, uh, we had almost 10,000 of our people say, uh, we love this company. We want to save this company. So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to bow out for a few months, Wow, uh, which is astounding. And it just says everything about, you know, about our people and, you know, you know, they're, they were, you know, well compensated and, and I hope, you know, a lot of them have savings that they can take care of. But, uh, you know, I think that gives me great hope that, uh, you know, we're going to be back and we're going to be back strong because, you know, these people are, are truly amazing. And it makes me all more the, the resolve to, 
really save those jobs, every single one of them, and make sure that they're all back to work, you know, as soon as possible. David, um, obviously, super, and you're super, you've been super involved in the U.S. domestic airline industry throughout your career with Morris Air, and you worked for Southwest, and then you founded JetBlue. Um, what's your sense of of the the sort of the domestic airline situation? I mean, a lot of the major carriers will get some government support, but I mean, we're talking about potentially months, many months of you know very very little air travel. Um, do you think that domestic carriers are going to survive this? Yeah, you know, let me, let me just go back to Brazil for one second because I think it's a good model for, for the U.S. So, um, you know, our, our major expenses that we have are obviously our crew members, you know, our, our salaried uh, folks. Um, that's number one. Number two is fuel. Uh, we're not flying, so we don't have that expense. And number three is obviously the cost of our aircraft. Um, we have great business partners, uh, people who have provided us airplanes. They know the position we're in. So we're not burning fuel. You know, a lot of our salaries have been reduced. And, and then our, 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 those that supply our planes for us have said, hey, don't pay us for six months. We're good. Uh, we're, we're fine. You know, we'll you catch, up, catch us up later. Because, right. you know, they know that Azul was one of the most profitable airlines in the world before this happened. And they know it's going to survive. In addition to that, and this is very important for the U.S. as well, um, there's probably, I don't believe there's another company in Brazil that has may, had a greater impact on the economy of Brazil, you know, than Azul has over the last 10 or 10 years since we've been in business. Um, you know, we serve over a hundred cities, uh, more than twice as that of our competitors. Mm-hmm. Um, um, if you take just the, the economic impact that we have on Brazil, not only do we buy Brazilian made airplanes and employ a bunch of people in Embraer, but we had a huge, it's, it's in the billions and billions of, 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 of you know, hey, ice that we have or dollars that we have an impact on the economy. So when it comes to a government and their policy and saying we need to preserve this, it's critically important because it's, it, all it is is a return on investment, right? Because if they're going to get the money back in taxes and, and employment and all that kind of stuff, then they do that. So the Brazilian government has been great. They've uh, stepped up. Uh, there's a development bank you know, in Brazil called BNDS, and they are, you know, are, are going to, you know, provide whatever capital we need to be able to to, to make make it through. So, so I, I don't have any concern that it's always right. going to be just fine. Now, moving to the U.S., your question in the U.S., um, you know, the the aid package that was given to the airlines was was fifty billion dollars. Um, you know, that's a lot, and and it was done for a reason because. Uh, you know, the, the economic benefit that these airlines bring to the U.S. is enormous. You need to have that. So there were some strings attached to the, to the aid that was given. Number one, it said that you have, to, you have to pay your people through the end of September, and you can't lay anybody off. So that's where, you know, a good portion of that money is going to go. It's going to pay salaries for these people. Um, the second thing is uh, they said you need to maintain service to a, to a minimal level to the cities that you had service to. And so we have a lot of flights flying around with really few or, or no people on it. In some cases, you're reading these cases of one or two people on an airplane. Right. So that's obviously uh, draining cash. You know, then, then there was another portion where they're going to get loans, you know, big loans for about $25 billion. Um, You know, these airlines were very strong um, financially uh, before, the, before the crisis. Um, I think the extent, um, I think a lot of it depends on if this thing is going to go for a year until we get a vaccine, or if we can figure out how to get back to work in a few months, doing some things that I, we can talk about later, which I think are fundamental and, and will change the things. If, if, so, you know, I, I was talking to one, you know, airline executive in the U.S., and they said, you know, we're probably going to be 25% smaller um, if we come back in a few months for the next few years. Wow. If this goes for a year, we could be 50% smaller. Wow. Or more. So you can imagine, I mean, just one, one major airline employs 100,000 people. So you can, yeah. these are very high paid jobs. Um, and so it's critical that we, we get this right and we figure out not only how to, how to deal with this issue, but we figure out how to, how to kind of stay with it as opposed to always having this thread of shutdown, open up, shut down. Um, I want to remind folks listening that you can submit your questions via um, our in the comment section in Facebook. Um, so please keep them coming. Um, David, you know, a lot of people who listen to How I Built This and who heard your interview and who um, who are watching this now come to the show for 
ideas and inspiration and a sense of possibility, right? Because our show really is, it's not just about success and success. It's about failure and crisis and challenge and navigating um, all those things. Um, a lot of small business owners right now are, you know, they're, they're sort of, they're, they're, they're conflicted, right? Because um, they want to stay safe. They want their families and communities to be safe and healthy, but their businesses are, are collapsing around them. They're, they're watching revenue, you know, trickle to, to nothing. Um, they're watching, um, you know, contracts canceled and retainers canceled. Um, so let's start talking about this idea of how do we create a path forward? And I know that you have, you know, you reached out to me last week to talk to me about some of the ideas that you have. You're talking to other business leaders about ways we could actually create a path forward Scott Gottlieb, the former FDA commissioner, has put something out um, to actually get businesses up and running. It may not be what it was before March 2020, but um, but something beginning to approach, um, you know, normal. So let let's sort of talk through that. What what do you think has to happen to in order to to preserve public safety and health, but also to kind of make sure that, you know, people can, can employ other people, can feed their families and, you know, can generate money for, for the U S economy. Yeah. Okay. I, I, thank you so much. Uh, I love talking about this. I mean, cause you know, I can, I can, I can talk to a small business owner and I can say, you know, do this and don't lay these people off and try and pay them and apply for the government loans. And, but if you don't get to the source of the problem, you know, it's like throwing toilet paper in a bonfire. I mean, it's just, it, you have to figure out, you have to go right to the source. And, you know, I, you know, because I'm so passionate about my people, you know, that I'm responsible for, you know, obviously my personal net worth has taken a major hit, but it, it, that's aside that the most important thing are these families in Portugal and the families in Brazil and the families in the United States of people that I, that are depending on, on, on me. So, you know, from the, from the very minute, I, I, I have hardly slept. I've spent all day long, you know, researching and talking to scientists and learning, and I've just become a sponge for this kind of stuff. And, you know, this isn't me talking. This is, and so what, what I decided is, well, I want to know the science of what's going on. I want to know the science of how this thing is transmitted. How are people catching it? You know, who are her catching it? You know, what effect is it having on them? And, and how can we better treat these people? Because, you know, what, you know, like I said, I'm right here in New York. I'm, you know, sirens or, you know, you can hear in New York City and, you know, the death toll is climbing every day and, you know, we're, we're seeing what's going on. And, 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 I, and I, I really feel strongly that we, we weren't, you know, we, and I don't have to feel strong. We were not prepared. No. But we, we, not only were we not prepared, but we did not adequately protect those people who were most at risk. You know, if, if you go on, there's a website that New York is logging. Um, you know, uh, you know, everyone who, who passed away and they have no underlying conditions and then they have those that have underlying conditions and then they list the ones, you know, it's, it's very rudimentary. It's not complete the data, but, um, as of this morning, there were of, of, I think over 3000 people that were logged in there. Um, mm -hmm. only 48 people didn't have an underlying condition and no, 55 people and 43 of them were men. So there was like 17 women who didn't have an underlying condition of these 3,000 people, you know, that passed away. And so, you know, one of the things that, that drives me absolutely crazy, and I, I'm just a sponge for data, like, you know, in Italy, who, who's dying there? And, and the health minister one day said, okay, on the 17th of March, he made this announcement. The people that died today, average 81 years old, had 2.7 on average underlying health conditions and 50, almost 50% had more than three underlying health conditions. Right. Well, you know, why, if that's the case in New York, and then we heard Governor Cuomo say 25% of those that have, have passed, you know, he said that a, a week or so ago, are in nursing homes. And he said, this is affecting the, the old, the sick. And so what, what drives me nutty is that we can build um, a field hospital in Central Park in 24 hours. We can bring in big ships. We can turn the Javits Center into 5,700 beds. But we, can't, we haven't figured out how, and we have to figure out how to take those that died every day and put them in a database that tells us 
not their age, age is secondary. What, what their underlying health conditions are, you know, click on exactly what they were, and then a drop down box to say, was it, was it mild, moderate, or severe? Because, you know, half of America has an underlying health issue, right? So right. just knowing that people with underlying health issues are dying, you know, is, is it enough? And we need to know this data so we can better protect the people. I mean, you're saying, you're basically what you're saying is we don't have enough data about who is dying from COVID-19 right now. If we had better data, we could better protect those vulnerable communities. But it sounds like what you're saying is if we could kind of protect the most vulnerable communities, we could, I don't know, let other people kind of re-enter into. Yeah. But, exactly. but isn't that, I mean, but I just wonder, I mean, is that 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 can't happen right away. Like, let's say we could protect everybody who is most vulnerable, right? And we have all this data, and we know really granular information about the people who've died, and we say, all right, we're going to keep these these folks have to stay isolated. Yeah. I mean, how do you create a system where you know? I, I I don't know. I don't I don't see a world where the rest of us can just go outside and get back on airplanes and 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 start well, getting back. Well, I think okay, so. Let me just, you know, let's just throw out some suppositions here. Let's assume that if we, you know, of this subset of, of the 10,000 people that died, let's just assume that, you know, 80% of them um, had at least three underlying health conditions or, you know, 50% had, had three and 80% and had two. And, and let's assume that these people are taking up virtually all of the ventilator time and all of the hospital time. Because that's what we're solving for. We're solving for ventilators and we're solving for hospital beds. Now, um, my, my parents are 85 and 86. My dad has an underlying health condition. Um, so what, what's the first thing we did when we heard about this? We put, we asked them, mom, dad, please, please go into quarantine. We're going to keep, and we tell, told them the rules. And my dad was reluctant and he, I want to see my grandkids. And I said, dad, you know that all that life savings you've lost? Um, if you stay, you know, quarantined, uh, you, there's a good chance you're going to get a lot of that back. So they said, okay, we'll do it. Now, not only did we, you know, quarantine them, but we, we stayed not six feet away, like we've been told, but we stayed 20 feet away or 30 feet away. We made sure that these aerosol droplets that you get were never going to infect my parents. Now, right. from a granular level, if, if, I, if I was the governor of a state today, if I was the, you know, and, you know, I have a brother that's, you know, helping in Utah. And, you know, one of the questions is, what should we do? Should we go test everybody today? Well, yep. if you give someone a PCR test today, it's good for how long? For today, right? It's not even good for tomorrow. What I would do if I was the governor, I would, I would convene uh, um, all the doctors. And I would say, okay, doctors, this is the red zone. These are the people that are at risk. Now, over the next week, I want you to contact all these people. I want you to use your local and state governments, you know, with the permission of the patient, obviously. I want you to use churches. I want to use charity organizations. And these are the rules of the game. These are absolutely certain. If you come within 20 feet of this person, they have to be wearing a mask and you have to be wearing a mask. And you have to, you know, I mean, there are several. This, there's no mystery to this thing. We know exactly how it's transmitted. And we know that 98, these people are using, a, uh, you know, these people that are tragically dying are using a disproportionate amount of the ventilator time. Now, th there's another point to this that I think is really critically important as well. You know, and so first of all, we, we, we do much, look, we've done, a, let's just admit it, we did a lousy job of protecting the people in New York. We, 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 we took WHO's recommendations and the you know, Centers for Disease Control's recommendation. We said, wash your hands, don't touch your face, and stay six feet away. Look what happened. We, we, we lost thousands but, of people. But David, I, wanna, I just want to interrupt for a moment because, I mean, if, I think, look, we know that down the road we're going to have to do mass testing. We're going to have to see who has um, the antibodies, right? Yes. And, yeah, and, that's what I said. hope that, that, that grants someone immunity. Again, not, we don't know if, if having had uh, COVID-19 grants you immunity from getting again. We just don't know. But the idea behind that is if we could test enough people we could start gradually allowing people out again. But, but the reality is that that's still a long, we're still talking about. It's, it's not, it's not, it's not. I mean, it's just not, not the case. So, um, you know, I have, I, I wrote a piece yesterday and you know, it was published. You put the links, I sent you the link for it. Um, you know, 
the, 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 first of all, let's, let's talk about antibody tests. So assuming that these people are okay and they're isolated, that's number one. Number two, you know, and I'll talk about antibodies, we need to create a national reserve for ventilators, for masks, for mm -hmm. gowns, for all that stuff. I mean, we, you know, from what I'm reading, we're going to produce 60,000 ventilators uh, in the next 60 days. Right. We're making 10,000 a day. So the National Reserve for Ventilators should be an absurd, an absurd number, right? 150,000, 200,000. Okay. And it, they should be scattered around the country and they could be delivered on a minute's notice. Second of all, you know, get a billion masks. All right, let's just make a billion masks and let's have them everywhere. So okay. that, that's important. Now, the third thing, and this is, is really simple and it's, and it's happening and it will happen really quickly. Uh, when you do polling to, to a presidential candidate, you, know, you don't go survey 500,000 people in New York City. You right. do a, a sample survey that statistically has a plus or minus variant of one or two percent. Right. So there have been there are have been developed and are in the process of being developed scores of antibody tests. Now there are two kinds of antibody tests that are out right now, um, simply. There's one that uses a flow strip where you prick your finger, yep. you drop three drops of blood in, and it tells you, um, you know, if you have the antibodies. There's two antibodies that come, IgG and IgM, um, that one comes sooner and one comes later. And you know if, you, if you've had the antibodies. Now, I have been involved heavily with, um, you know, there's a group of, of scientists at Stanford that have these tests, they've been tested, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and there's several of them. It, it, right. It's right around 85 to 95 percent. All of them test 85 to 95. Yep. So um, you don't need 100 percent for this, obviously, survey, as long as you know 85 to 85. So if I sent 20,000 of these kids today to New York, yep. and overnight I had 20,000 people prick their finger, put it on there, send me an upload. You video, would have a sample size. You would have a sample size right. that's correct. And, right. if, and if New York, because today, if you take the number of people that have tested positive in New York, it's 1% of the population. So right. 25,000 people, that's what it was yesterday. But if I were to get that back, and all of a sudden I knew that it was 20% of the people who had the antibodies, or even 10% of the people that had the antibodies, I would know that the case mortality rate of 2% that we have in New York is, is either divided by 10 or 20. Right. Now, let me just say one thing, Guy, because yeah. this is important. Because, so when you said this is going to take time, um, I talked to a lab last night that can produce 3,000 of these a day. And mm -hmm. I talked to another one that says they can produce, you know, 5,000 in a day. So if we were to go out and, and 100,000 tests spread across America every day, or, you know, and we could test how, how this thing's moving, and how it is, then what you can do is you can take and, and start using data to solve for ventilators. Take the right. demographics of the area, you know, assume 50% compliance and start saying, how many ventilators do we need in this town? And that's 10,000. Okay, give them, give them I mean, it's 2,000 ventilators. Okay, give them 5,000. Right. You know? So you can start doing that with the data much more intelligently. I want to. I want to. Um, I want to get to some questions, David. I mean, basically, your your argument is, and I think it's an argument that a lot of people who own businesses are making, which is a you know valid argument. Is how do we figure out how to get people back out into into society? Right. This is a huge challenge. We we um we want to keep people safe, but we also um you know we want to keep um businesses up and running because there's also health risks when the economy um, collapses, right? Um, so I want to I get to some questions here. Um, this is a, a question from Sam Speed, um, and he's asking, what is your strategy as a business owner to restore confidence in air travel, right? A lot of people are wondering, well, even if business does reopen, people are still going to be wary, uh, weary of going out and for, you know, sitting on airplanes. Um, what, how do you, David Nealman, say to your customers, listen, this is, we're ready to go. This is oh, going to be okay. What is, what is your sort of thinking around that? Okay. So n number one, I think um, specifically to the aerodynamics of our airplanes. I mean, we have um, one thing that's amazing about an airplane versus maybe, you know, another, other modes of transportation is that we have these amazing pressurized cabins that um, have these hyper um, filtration systems that are used in intensive care rooms. HEPA filters. HEPA filters, yeah. So 
we, we circulate the air about every two minutes. It's, it's unbelievable how the air is circulating, which would give people confidence on aerosol. Now, if it means that, you know, to, to keep the aerosol uh, part, particles down, then we hand a mask to everybody on the flight and say, hey, just wear this during the flight. If right. that makes people feel better, then. That's a great idea. Yeah, we hand people a, a, a towel and say, we've cleaned this airplane, but if you feel like you want to wipe it around a little again, you're, here's, here's, a, here's a, a, you know, a package of stuff, you can wipe it down. And, you know, you can and, and let them know about the filters. And, you know, I, I'm confident based on the science that, that people um, will, the likelihood of being affected on an airplane are, is, is really low. Do you so, think, David, by the way, uh, anyone who's traveled in Asia is used to seeing people on flights wearing masks. You've seen that for years and years. And um, do you think that in the future that's just going to be par for the course, that m many, many people will wear masks on airplanes? I think it depends on – on what we know about this this virus, because you know, if we um, if we determine that um, you know this factor is off by twenty or thirty, and you know you divide that out, and, and the and the mortality rate uh, or the case fatality rate equals that of maybe 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 the flu. Now I know that's that's really controversial to say, but except for those that are very ill and very have underlying health issues, I think it will help calm people down. A little bit, but there's always this case in the early months that hey, you may have it, you're asymptomatic, you could be giving me it. So yeah, so yeah, uh, yeah. but that that will that will fix itself over time, I believe. Yeah, um, but I mean, look, and and I don't want to I don't want to sort of push this too far, but I mean, you are a very healthy man, but you are just by the because of your age, you're more at risk than than someone ten years younger than you. The data the data doesn't say that, uh, guy, and, and if we had the data. Um, we would we would know if we had the complete data set of those things exactly the yeah. way we want them. Um, you know, somebody who's 55 and smokes, um, you know, maybe is you know morbidly obese, um, is probably a hundred times more likely to 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 die from this than I am. Um, so it, it, the data says that. So you know, I you know, so I, I think I think we just have to look at the data. underlying health conditions are. I can't say this enough, are really more important than age. But obviously age, once you get up to a certain age, when our, when our immune systems are, you know, getting, getting weak, you know, not working as right. well. But that, I understand that's that. That's why you get underlying more health issues too. Just to be clear, I mean, I, I, if I understand you right, you're not saying that, hey, you've got underlying health issues, sorry, because there are lots of people who have underlying health issues because they're in chemotherapy or, or, or they, they're cancer survivors. Um, you're arg you're, what you're arguing is, those people who are most vulnerable, they need to be protected in a more extreme way than the rest of the population. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if we had every day, if, if in, as part of the presidential briefing, we said, okay, let's give us today's results. Yesterday, we lost a thousand Americans. Um, the, the average age was this, but particularly everybody, you know, if you are a cancer survivor, if you're on chemotherapy, this is particularly deadly. You cannot be exposed. I mean, if we had that kind of detail that was going out to the American people, every day it's just like, wash your hands, mask is, masks are optional, remain six feet away. That's not, that, that's, that, that, that's, you know, those instructions did not save the people in New York. Yeah. D David, I know that you, you briefly alluded to this earlier about like a small business owner asking you, what do I do? And you, you know, of course you, you would say, well, try to keep your employees and try to, keep, you know, apply for the, the, the payroll protection um, plan that the federal government is offering. But um, I mean, it, it's a hard answer because there's so many different kinds of businesses. But um, I mean, you're running a big business, right? If you um, were running a small business now that still depended on, you know, people, people buying your product um, and you saw your business dry up, um, I don't know, what, what do you, what would you start to think about doing? I mean, even with respect to your business, which is a very big business, um, I mean, there are going to be changes you will make. Some of those changes actually might be interesting. They might be creative changes. They might be changes that you couldn't have done without a crisis. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, good question. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because I have a lot of entrepreneurs. My kids are entrepreneurial and you know, I have, I have a daughter that has a shoe business and her business is continuing. I mean, obviously the big department stores have canceled all their orders. And so she's, she's working through that. Um, I have a son that has a farm that he mail orders, um, you know, it's called Valerie Farm, but he, he they mail order, um, you know, pasture raised meat. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole experience. Their business has never been better. Um, right. I have another son who, 
you know, has a, a son-in-law who has a company called Fishkin and, and they do, you know, uh, cap, you know, covers for laptops. His business has never been better. So people are home, they're, they're buying things that's online. And so I guess the answer to your question would be try and envision what the new norm is going to be and try to run to that and tailor make your business to that, you know, as opposed to maybe thinking that, you know, what you're doing today is just going to be adequate and it's going to be fine. Now, I hope that, you know, through through antibody testing and all this stuff, we're going to be able to get back to nearly as normal as we were. But yeah. you have to assume that, that there would be different. And how can you, you know, you know, is there something that that suitcase company can manufacture uh, or something that people are going to need more? What, what, what add-ons to that suitcase can they do to make people feel more protected when they travel? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can That's do. Ac it's actually great advice. Think about what, you know, what is, what, what's this going to look like afterwards and try to go, try to sort of move in that direction. Um, we're, we're out of time, David, but I just want to say thanks to a couple of people who, who've been watching Jim McKay. Sorry, we can get to your question. Marianne Jensen, Kelly Robinson. Um, thank you to Don Cole Easterday in Indiana, uh, Fabio Alvarez, South Florida, Nolan Tomlinson, South Georgia, James Goslin, Texas. Hello, Rick Brown, Ohio, St uh, Stephen Buckrock in Naples, Florida. David Bruce in Oklahoma, uh, Rhonda Pullum in Detroit, and many, many more. Thank you so much for listening. Um, before we let you go, David, I want to remind everyone watching that uh, we've got a new episode of How I Built This coming out on Monday. Every week, we've got a new episode now. We're running new episodes. We're cranking up, and we're working really hard to get new episodes out. It's Sweet Green, um, the story of Sweet Green, the salad uh, company, and, of course, how, they're, how they've been affected by the situation. That comes out on the podcast on Monday. This Friday, I'll be having another live video conversation with another How I Built This alum, uh, Tristan Walker, who started the company Walker and uh, started Walker and Company. They make bevel razors, incredible um, beauty products. Um, also, uh, more uh, more announcements tomorrow um, in your podcast audio feed. You will see my conversation from last week with Susan Griffin Black, the founder of EO Products. They're ramping up on hand sanitizer. She talks about how her business is coping and has some really great ideas like David's. Um, and then also we've got a new episode out this week, uh, How I Built This, about swell bottles. So um, if you haven't listened, check it out. Um, I will see you back here uh, live on Friday. David, I will catch up with you, I'm sure, over the phone. Um, it's so great to have you. We're obviously all hoping that, um, you know, you pull through and, and we're back flying on your airlines um, and traveling and uh, probably in a different way. But, um, but um, you know, we're sending you our, our good energy and thank you for coming on. And, um, and thanks everybody for watching. I'm hopeful. It's, it's, we're going to get through this. It's, uh, it's, it's going to quick, end quicker than we think. I, yeah. I'm confident. That. Thanks, David.